Hello and welcome to Mississippi Insight. I'm Byron Brown. Thank you for joining us. This week, COVID-19 is raging through Mississippi once again. Governor Tate Reeves responds. We'll have his latest moves as the pandemic overwhelms a hospital network. Also, a hard look at a Jackson Hospital's debt collection practices. Thousands of patients facing lawsuits. And in many cases, the hospital knew these patients couldn't afford their care in the first place. Reporter Giacomo Bologna has details on his investigation. That's all coming up on Mississippi Insight. Governor Tate Reeves faced news reporters late last week to discuss his response to the surge in COVID-19 cases. Among his actions, extending the state of emergency across the state, requesting emergencies to report from the federal government, and especially with medical staffing, and encouraging the two-thirds of unvaccinated Mississippians to get their shots against this menacing virus. But he declined to issue any so-called top-down state-level orders, whether mandating masks or vaccinations. He argued with reporters who asked him about a potential masking mandate. And many of the questions Friday centered on new cases rising from our classroom environments, we're going to play excerpts from that key news conference. It came on a day when Mississippi broke its daily case record at 5,023, more people infected. First, Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves. I want to uh, personally thank Dr. Dobbs and Director McCraney for joining us here today uh, and for their dedication to ensure uh, that we get past what is clearly the fourth wave of the pandemic and particularly the Delta variant. Dr. D Dobbs and Director McCraney, uh, along with their teams, have been in constant communication uh, over the last uh, several months and year and a half now, um, and they have been instrumental in their efforts in helping us combat COVID, uh, and I am proud to serve alongside them. I'd, I'd also like to take this opportunity to say a particular thank you to the men and women and all the folks at the Department of Health, the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, and the Mississippi National Guard for going above and beyond in their efforts to make the vaccination process run as smoothly and as efficiently as humanly possible. At this time, I'd like to provide a few updates on several areas of Mississippi's COVID-19 response. As I have said repeatedly over the last several days, this current wave seems more and more to be a pandemic of the unvaccinated. I saw it written earlier today, uh, and it went a step further. Uh, when you look across the country, to a certain extent, this current wave is the pandemic of the unvaccinated in areas of the country where it's extremely hot and where people have gone inside. We are headed towards a new peak and there are a number of challenges that lie ahead. However, we must continue to focus and we must continue to remain calm, moving forward with logic, with reason, and by following the data. I ask all Mississippians to do the same. We will get through this new onslaught of COVID just as we have gotten through the three previous waves, but we all must work together and do our part so that we can get back to some semblance of normalcy as soon as possible. The difference between this peak and our last peak is evident by the data. That difference lies within those who are vaccinated versus those who are not. I want to be clear, I've been vaccinated. And if you're watching us on Facebook Live today, you probably got to watch me get vaccinated, thanks to the help of some of Dr. Dobbs' uh, finest employees. My mom's been vaccinated. My dad's been vaccinated. My wife's been vaccinated. My grandmom has been vaccinated. I believe the vaccines are safe. I believe they are effective. And I believe that they are the best tool we have moving forward to beat the virus. When we look at the deaths that we've had over the past four days, I want to do a little bit of a dive. We've lost four healthy people in their 20s, two of whom were pregnant, zero vaccinated. If we look at those who were in their 30s in the past four days, we've lost 10 people in their 30s. And these aren't people who are 
chronically ill, cancer patients, these are normal people who were at work last, you know, or a couple of weeks ago. Ten people in their 30s have died from COVID, zero vaccinated. If we look at those in their 40s, we've had 12 die. Two of those were vaccinated. And then if we look at those who are in their 50s to 60s, 17, uh, 50 to 60, 17 have died and one was vaccinated. I mean, there's a pattern here. We are seeing um, clearly vaccine breakthrough, but by and large, the vaccine has been incredibly protective and helpful, and especially for people who are under 50. People who are over 70, over 80, we are seeing more breakthrough deaths, but we're not all that surprised as you've seen from our previous conversations. That leads me to a couple of other things that I do want to talk about. As you may be aware, FDA yesterday approved the use of additional doses of vaccine or booster doses for people in certain high risk categories. Specifically, those are people who have weakened immune systems, people like who are on cancer chemotherapy, or maybe they're on immunosuppressive drugs for autoimmune disorders, or maybe transplant patients. Um, the group of people who are likely to qualify, according to CDC's meeting today, are probably going to be very similar to the Health Alert Network message we sent out on July 23rd. But I do want to be very clear, this isn't a blanket booster recommendation. This is only for people who have clear, weakened immune systems. Expect to see more information going forward, but we really look forward to giving docs this guidance. Um, they've been awaiting for additional clearance from FDA and CDC to start doing this more and more in their clinics. We still are going to recommend at this time that people in these groups still have that conversation with their doctor, but we're going to try to make more and more availability for these folks into the future. But right now, it still needs to be a physician-patient conversation uh, for the most part. So stay tuned. Um, spe specific details are on the way. The last thing I really want to sort of jump into is a monoclonal antibody treatment. Um, that is such an effective way to keep out of the hospital and also to prevent death. We definitely want for folks to be vaccinated and to get protected. But, you know, everybody is not vaccinated. And if you get COVID, we want you to talk to your daughter, doctor about getting monoclonal antibodies. We've seen a, you know, a multifold increase in our utilization. We have 40 plus centers of excellence around the state. We've requested 10 federal teams to come augment that effort covering some of the geographic gaps we have within that, that sort of center of excellent network. And we also have a lot of other private clinics that are doing it. Um, so we're gonna try to maximize that resource. The long and short of it is, if you get COVID, the first thing you do is talk to your doctor about monoclonals. Even if you don't feel that bad yet. You don't wanna wait until you're so sick it's not gonna work for you. And if you're someone who is vaccine hesitant and haven't made that jump yet, don't be antibody hesitant, right? If you get COVID, we don't wanna be having the conversation as you're getting wheeled into the ICU saying, hey doc, what can I do about it now? It's too late. Let's see health officer, Dr. Thomas Dobbs offering his observations. We'll have reporter Q and A with the governor when Mississippi Insight continues. And welcome back. The governor got a little testy with some of the journalists at Friday's briefing. It's noteworthy that this news conference was not available for reporters joining by video call, as had been the case. But Governor Reeves took plenty of pointy questions from local news media. Here are some excerpts. COVID-19, even in the earliest weeks, we're seeing much more transmission in schools, much more quarantines, and in fact, entire districts are having to go virtual. Doesn't, didn't the mask mandate help kids, keep kids in school last year, and can't it help keep them in school this year? Well, you know, I'd love for you to go to the state of Louisiana where their governor um, issued a statewide mask mandate. Um, everyone in here's hair is on fire, and understandably so, because we had 5,015 cases uh, reported today. The seven-day moving average in the state of Louisiana is almost 6,000. So they've had 42,000 cases in the last year, in, in the last week, and they had a statewide mask mandate in place the entire time. So here is the reality. What we say, the what we write on the page, what, what we do, doesn't matter a flip. What matters is how individuals act, what they choose to do. I would tell you for a 14-year-old kid or a 16-year-old kid that is in 
uh, a school that has gone and gotten uh, double vaccinated, I don't think they ought to have to wear a mask in the classroom. I do not think they ought to have to wear a uh, mask in the classroom. Um, I think for kids under the age of 12, the, the, we saw last year that there was very little transmission and we saw that, that when there was transmission, there was very rarely a, um, a, a significantly negative outcome. Very, very, very rare. Uh, today your messaging about vaccination appears pretty strong, maybe stronger in the past. You didn't mention choice or, or whatever. It, it, it has something changed in your mind uh, as far the, the, as respecting people's choice? Or? No. Uh, I, what, in fact, the, um, the, the, you know, the, 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 what your organization has been writing uh, is a figment of your imagination uh, as to what I have said. I have been consistent uh, for since the day I was on Facebook Live in January that I believe that the best course of action for individuals is to get vaccinated. But even though I believe that, Jeff, I don't be even begin to think I'm so much smarter, unlike some of you, I don't think I'm so much smarter than every other Mississippian that I ought to be telling them what to do. I tell them what I think is right, but I am going to forevermore defend their right to make the decision that is best for them and their family, period. Governor, uh, with cases just kind of continually climbing upwards the last couple of weeks and you know, now we've got patients in a hospital parking garage. Do you feel like you could have done more the last three or four weeks or been more present? Well, obviously, uh, again, another figment of the imagination of the press. Uh, over the last 15 days, uh, I've been available to the press five times. Um, Thursday at Neshoba County Fair, uh, last week in uh, the Tupelo area, uh, twice yesterday on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and then today here in the Jackson market. And so um, the reality is we've been working very hard uh, doing exactly what I said I was going to do in March. Uh, in March, you'll recall I was very clear. Uh, my advice to Mississippians in March was to get your shot and live your life. And that's what we've been trying to do. And when you're governor, living your life is, is part of managing and maintaining a pretty uh, significantly busy schedule, working very closely with our emergency management team, and I have the utmost confidence that we have done everything that we can to deal with the crisis that is before us, and we will continue to do exactly the same. That's Governor Tate Reeves answering reporter questions on his handling of the pandemic. We'll have Jack Bologna with his investigation of St. Dominic's debt collection practices in a moment. St. Dominic's Hospital in Jackson is the focus of a new investigation. It looks at the hospital's pattern over the years of suing many of its patients over medical debt. The patients impacted a number of in the thousands, according to our next guest. Giacomo Bologna has just published his findings at the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. He joins us now by Zoom. Giacomo, welcome to Mississippi Insight. Thank you for having me. You've been looking back over years of public data to learn about St. Dominic's debt collection practices. How did you find this information and how long has this been going on? Yeah, so I examined court records from 2018 to 2020 in Hines County. Uh, it involved looking through thousands of digitized court records, but then also tens of thousands of paper court records in a Hines County Justice Court. Uh, the investigation found that uh, St. Dominic Hospital here in Jackson has sued more than 3,600 patients over medical debt. Well, St. Dominic and debt collectors that work on its behalf have sued uh, more than 3,600 uh, patients between 2018 and 2020. That is in Hines County alone. And so the uh, it's probably a drastic undercount of the total amount of patients being sued for medical debt. Uh, I went up to Madison County and also Rankin County and saw that there were cases also being filed against St. Dominic patients there as well. Why are they suing and, and who are they targeting, basically? Are they the, the um, are these poor patients that they're going after? So uh, not necessarily, um, but they uh, typically sue folks uh, or they pass um, bills on to collections agencies that sue folks uh, if patients have not been responding to medical bills. So that could be the case of someone who can't afford a medical bill but just doesn't respond to it. 
but sometimes it is people who uh, can't afford medical bills and either uh, don't know how to apply for financial aid or chose not to apply uh, for financial aid. But the effects on low income and poor folks can be uh, devastating, uh, including having wages garnished, uh, having bank accounts seized, having uh, their credit severely damaged, and uh, even bankruptcy. Are they winning these cases or, or, or what's happening? Are they, making, are they collecting all that money that they're going after? So, yeah, most cases, um, you know, defendants don't even show up to them. They, they most cases are handled in justice court. Uh, I actually watched some of these proceedings. They last, you know, less than a minute typically, um, you know, or, or even really seconds, honestly. Um, and most cases are, you know, e either end with uh, an agreement between um, the patient and the debt collector to uh, pay, you know, a certain amount of fees every month. Uh, or they just win these default judgments and then can pursue uh, garnishments. So in the 3,600 cases that I reviewed involving St. Dominic's, um, garnishments were pursued in almost 70% of those cases. What's the amount of money that they're going after and what's the average amount of money that these, uh, these patients owe? Yeah, so most of these debts are for $1,000, $2,000, a few hundred dollars. Um, occasionally, there are bigger debts of you know many thousands of dollars, but generally these are small amounts uh, that um, still can have quite devastating effects on the individual patients. Though I saw one case of a woman uh, who was working uh, at a dollar store, uh, making about seven twenty-five an hour, and she had her wages garnished for more than a year to pay back uh, just you know a debt of about a thousand dollars. Why do you think that uh, St. Dominic is going after these patients? So it, I should be clear that it's not just St. Dominic that sues uh, patients uh, over medical debt. It's, it's lots of hospitals all across the country. Um, I, here in Jackson, uh, Baptist uh, also sues patients over medical debt, although I found that St. Dominic appears to be more aggressive and sues more people uh, when it comes to medical debt. Um, hospitals will, will generally tell you, you know, that they run a uh, pretty small profit if they do have a profit and that you know, it's important that they collect all the money that they can. Um, but experts that I talked to uh, have said that you know, these lawsuits typically generate a tiny, tiny fraction of a hospital's overall revenue. Um, and e even though it has such a tiny revenue, it still can have you know, very devastating impacts on those individual patients. What have the hospital St. Dominic or its owners say in response to uh, your, your findings and your reporting? Yeah, so uh, St. Dominic's did release uh, a statement to me. Uh, they declined uh, to make any executives available for interviews citing the kind of surge in COVID cases. But they said that the hospital, you know, is dedicated to um, providing uh, charitable care to uh, poor and lower income folks. Um, and they recently have stopped suing uh, patients uh, on their own, they still employ debt collectors who can sue patients. And traditionally, they have sued very few patients on their own, typically relying on debt collectors to file those cases. Has St. Dominic gotten more aggressive because they changed uh, ownership and uh, who owns them now, or has that had anything to do with it? No, that doesn't appear to be the case at all. Um, St. Dominic's, they, while they did continue to sue folks uh, during the pandemic, the cases actually declined uh, pretty significantly. Um, and they were, uh, they came under the ownership of the Franciscan Missionaries, uh, you know, which is a Louisiana based organization uh, in July of 2019. So lawsuits continued after that. Um, but again, they did decline during the pandemic. And then recently, uh, St. Dominic's has adopted a more generous charitable care policy that went into place this July that I think aligns with the other hospitals that again are part of this Louisiana um, based health system. So what's the message to patients out there uh, if they uh, have to go to St. Dominic or, or Baptist or one of these hospitals? I think it's really important for patients to know that if they're going to a nonprofit hospital anywhere, not just St. Dominic or Baptist, but any nonprofit hospital in the state, um, that there are federal guidelines on charity care. Uh, they're typically called a financial assistance policy. And uh, for many hospitals throughout the state and across the country, if you make, um, you know, really anywhere near the federal poverty limit, you should be getting uh, either a full or, or somewhat of a discount on your uh, hospital bill. 
Uh, again, this is because nonprofit hospitals are uh, entities that get huge tax breaks. They pay virtually no taxes. And so in return, they're supposed to give a community benefit. And one of the biggest community benefits they're supposed to be giving is charitable care to poor and lower income uh, people. So again, if you're going to a nonprofit hospital, um, really, you know, do your best to learn about that financial assistance policy. Uh, it should be posted in that hospital. Uh, every hospital is required to post it online. Um, and St. Dominic recently adopted a more, as we were talking about, adopted a more generous policy. So, Dr. Juan Bologna, thank you for joining us and talking about this this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and we'll be right back. Our thanks to Jack Bologna for joining us this week. We'll be back next weekend with more of the political and current affairs coverage that you demand. I'm Byron Brown. From all of us here at 12 News, make it a great weekend.